All right, so I think we all know who Yale Patch is. <laughs> I think no introduction is necessary. Uh, Yale, we're running about 10 minutes late, though, so if you can, so you know, I'll just talk uh, for, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can uh, help us make up that time, right? I will try. Okay, Jason. Do I need the mic or what? They're, vi yeah. they're videotaping it. The video is so brought by the hardware faculty. Uh, no, 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 kill it. So I want the beginning when I tell you I want the beginning, okay? okay. I'm not ready yet. So I do need a babysitter. So go, go ahead, do it. I do need a babysitter, and uh, Mo when Moyne told me that he wanted to speak just before me, I said, I said that's great because I can take advantage of uh, that fact. Uh, he also stole my thunder with thanking you for coming to my mid-career uh, celebration. <laughs> Owner already told you that uh, it should have been called Yale at 35, since I'm only 35 years old. And uh, since I got my PhD 48 years ago, I think at the age of minus 13, I was the youngest PhD to ever graduate from that <laughs> university. Uh, and in fact, uh, it's, uh, so it's what, 48 years, so I figure another 48. I hope you will all stay healthy, exercise, eat good, think good, so you'll be available to uh, help me celebrate my, uh, my Yale at 100, which uh, Moyne is already uh, pushing on. I uh, have to do a couple of things first. After I get through, after you've put up with me, there's going to be a fantastic panel. Uh, and I was a little bit concerned when I invited the speakers to be part of that panel, and I was overjoyed when they aggressively said, yes, I want to be on that panel. So I think the panel is going to be uh, fantastic. Uh, I also uh, need to uh, thank AMD and Apple for contributing to this thing that we've got going on today. Uh, the uh, Electrical and Computer Engineering Department uh, gave us a budget, it was a budget with a lowercase b, <laughs> and uh, there's no way we could have pulled it off with that budget, but fortunately AMD and Apple uh, came to our rescue, and so uh, I need to thank them. Uh, there were a couple of things that some of the people said that I need to pick on before I get started. <laughs> I just can't let it go. Uh, when May's hand-drawn slide, by the way, what he didn't tell you was a number of hours in my office arguing with him because something about his sensibilities did not want to have a hand-drawn diagram show up in the proceedings. And instead, he wanted this ridiculously ugly Mac draw thing that he had <laughs> come up with. What I ought to do is put that on my, that's what I should do, I should put it on my website, your Mac draw. My, I said, if I can't do better by hand than that thing, I'm going to give it up. <laughs> uh, Bob said there was something with Colwell good disappeared too. You're over where? Oh, there you are. Yeah. So uh, you're wrong. It was on. <laughs> it was on that slide. Now you got to remember, the slide is mine, but the presentation was owner's. So. When the architect looks down, he's looking at technology. Now, you mentioned time to market. You don't produce the chip in two weeks. So he has to predict where that technology is going to be at the time when the slide is going to go. So this imperfect knowledge thing is absolutely on that slide. And it's only in two places. One is the technology. Ah, you remember the Alpha 21164? Had a three-way set associative cache. Why? Because when they predicted, they predicted too aggressively, and the four-way set associative cache would have been, a fourth of it would have been off the chip. So they cut back to a 96K three-way set associative cache. And looking at what the dream is, how much of that is going to work. So the concept of the architect not having perfect knowledge is absolutely correct, but it's in the slide. It's just that, as most of my slides, they don't tell the whole story. <laughs> Phil. Where's Phil? So you're correct that the scaling of uh, getting lambda smaller and smaller has produced a big win. But microarchitecture has produced an equal win. Right? 
It's not that it is the case that you could forget about microarchitecture. You wouldn't get what we've gotten. So my favorite example is also from the Alpha family, from uh, EV4 to EV8, a span of 10 years, frequency went up by a factor of seven. That is, you get seven X out of frequency, performance went up by a factor of 55. And when I was a lad, my father taught me that 55 divided by seven is bigger than seven, see? So you do get it out of the microarchitecture. I won't pick on anybody else. I told you about AMD and Apple, the panel. Okay, so um, it turns out that uh, Arvind started us off and he made an important point and I, and I said, ah, I've got to, in fact, Guri's gonna love this. Guri, I'm not only gonna do PowerPoint, I'm gonna do a video clip. <laughs> so let's do the video clip. Now, which unit is that? <laughs> which specialized unit? Farouk. Go ahead, so hit it. So let's uh, Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, Arvin, Arvin's still here? Yeah. yeah. So you would agree with that, yeah. right? Yeah. That was an interview they did, I triple did it. I think it's on the YouTube web, but I wanted to uh, make that point. Okay, with that, um, so I guess we do this, right? Is it on the screen? It is. And uh, like Guri, uh, my PowerPoint is amazing, see? In fact, Sanjay Patel uh, so said, you know, you're incredible. You've taken this rich, incredible, rich structure called PowerPoint and reduced it to overhead transparencies. <laughs> Which he's, uh, he's absolutely right. I'm sorry? So we're renaming the field. We're gonna call it Compter Architecture from now on. Okay, so what do I wanna do today? Uh, first, an admission, then some observations. Most of this is about the observations. What do we do about it? How do we do it? And what will be the, help, the hopeful uh, result? Uh, so the admission is what I care about, what I don't care about. Uh, what I care about is curing cancer. Uh, predicting tsunamis. I use that as two examples of the kinds of things I want to do. I'm not interested in, in fact, one of you guys already said it, uh, improving the performance of Microsoft Word, you know, uh, or making it easier for some people to write boring payroll programs. I'm not suggesting those two things aren't important, it's just it's things that were good enough I don't care about. What I care about is pushing the envelope to get serious problems done uh, faster. Uh, this multi-core nonsense that we uh, now, by the way, tomorrow will be the end of Moore's Law. Today it's with the advent of multi-core is the way the abstracts uh, start. But multi-core, the emphasis has been on uh, throughput. What about latency? Uh, and latency is equally important. Uh, okay, what I did, because I didn't realize I didn't have to, is uh, give you the next slide in order to keep in your mind this next slide. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't have to. And the point has been made by so many people that there is this, these layer of transformations. I like Bob's thing with the goose sticking out at those interfaces. And I particularly like Pear driving through. His resource manager is absolutely right, and that's gonna play out later on in some of my observations. But we have been taught each of these layers as standalone layers, and I suggest, I'm giving you now the punchline, is I suggest that what is important is uh, people to be aware. When the VLSI thing started, they talked about the long, thin man, and I think that is incredibly needed now. So, observations. 
Uh, GPUs are being pushed to do non-GPU stuff. Uh, scientific applications, how about database? I've always thought the database is a SIMD problem. That is, you got all these records, and now you can interrogate them, if you will, in SIMD fashion. Uh, somebody, by the way, uh, you, you didn't comment, but uh, one of the speakers discovered array of structures versus structures of arrays, and you noticed that, right? So you need to talk to him afterwards. Uh, database, so what I could do is I could say, uh, I want everybody in the room to stand up, okay? That's one, uh, SIMD, stand up. Everybody stands up. Then I say, uh, if you're making less than 150K a year, sit down, all right? A lot of people sit down. If you own a boat, sit down. You've got a use for your discretionary money. If you've got three kids to send to college, sit down. And by now, there's a, uh, if you have an IQ of greater than 70, sit down, see? Now there's only one guy standing, and I say, come with me, I got some oceanfront property in Austin to sell you, right? <laughs> but it's a SIMD problem, see? And SIMD is one of the ingredients, ingredients of GPU. So GPUs use the scientific, and for a database, the problem, the GPU is down here. It's breaking those layers and spanning those layers that's important. Uh, Derek is uh, on leave right now at Microsoft, saying that, look, I got this array of cores. How about an array of FPGA fabric? And eventually, my, I think what's going to end up being not the next chip, but the couple of chips down the road, you'll have, for each core in this array, you're going to have a piece of the, um, uh, each G CPU core in the array, you're going to have a piece of the fabric, the FPGA fabric. If you understand the problems and the algorithms, you can tune those, a piece of that FPGA fabric so that when the code is running and it needs that special thing to be done faster, and FPGAs are faster than software, you know, obviously. So kick it up to the fabric, do the job, come back down. Can't do it unless you know about the pro problem you're trying to solve, the algorithms uh, to do it. Spanning uh, the spectrum. Embedded controllers. You know, they've been around for a long time, and they're domain-specific. Domain-specific implies looking at the whole spectrum as a total uh, entity. Uh, and you're right, x86 is an ugly architecture. I never, so my favorite architecture, bar none, other than the LC3, of course, which is in my freshman book, PDP-11, very clean design. And uh, Mike Flynn a long time ago mentioned that it's good to have more than one size, not this nonsense of one byte or two bytes or three bytes up to 16 bytes like the x86 does, but having two or three different sizes is a win. Mike showed us that back around, what, 1990 or, or thereabouts. PDP-11 had that, and the follow-on of that chip was Motorola 68000, which... But as you pointed out, it's not about technology, it's about economics, and that's why the x86... In my view, that's why x86 beat... Um, 68,000. The point is that the embedded controller space is all about that spectrum and knowing about the application and knowing about the uh, uh, microarchitecture and knowing about the circuits, et cetera. Accelerators. So I think the future accelerators are going to go async for some, asynchronous for some, some number of cycles and then they'll sync in. And so when you design that accelerator, you say, okay, this is going to take five cycles, six cycles, whatever. You can take advantage of not worrying about the clock edge for this amount of time. But you're not going to know what accelerators to build even unless you have some idea what the algorithms uh, need. Moore's law may not last forever. And that's, that's been brought up by several people. Uh, I am a little reluctant to discount engineering ingenuity. but. Chances are pretty good that 10 years from now we won't be talking about uh, Moore's Law anymore, and if that's true, then we're going to have to be even smarter about how we do things on the chip. You know, Matteo, on one of his slides, he had a bunch of, you know, you get seasick looking at all the things that Matteo's done over the years. One of his bullets was this uh, virtual physical register thing, so at rename time, 
you identify, you give a label to a register, but you don't allocate the physical register until the result comes out of the functional unit and has to be deposited. So you don't waste all that power and all those registers that are not needed until they're needed. That's, that's my favorite example of something which can be added on to how we do things now, uh, but do it better because Moore's Law is dead and we've got to be smarter about how we deal with the transistors uh, on the chip. Uh, latency as well as throughput. Uh, the runtime system, this I guess was uh, Pear's thing about the research man a resource manager, which I agree with. So the runtime system, how about putting the run, how about making the runtime system be part of the chip design? Right? The operating system is going to make a decision based on what? Based on what's going on in the chip. So we got monitoring stuff going on in the chip that has to go up to the operating system. The operating system says, yeah, do this, comes back down. Zoop, zoop. How about if we build it into the hardware, into the microarchitecture, this resource manager? And so the input to the resource manager are these monitors that are going around checking out things that are going on in the code. The programmer, who knows something about his or her piece of work, puts pragmas into the code. The compiler takes those pragmas and boils it into the executable image as procedure calls to this runtime system. And then the runtime system gets called by the program running to do some checking, uses the monitoring information on the chip, makes the decisions there. That's one artifact, a way of doing it. The key idea is that this resource manager is down low, close to the metal where it belongs. You don't get that unless you understand the whole spectrum of things. The silliness of a multiple ISA multi-core chip. There was a paper in ISCA this year where they said, gee, why don't we have multiple ISAs in the different cores on the chip? Why would I want to worry about endianness of different cores, page sizes, data types, all these different things that, no. Correct answer in my view is a single ISA, but multiple microarchitectures. And you have that single ISA with the same page size and the same data types, the same everything, but what we implement on each of the cores is tailored for the kind of work that needs to be done. Again, you don't get that unless you can span that whole spectrum. Uh, I used to be, you know, I remember giving a talk in Illinois once and they said, all this stuff you're doing, you know, with the accelerators and the branch prediction and everything, uh, what percent of the market are you dealing with? And I said, well, clearly, 0% of the market, but it's the most important 0% of the market. Okay? I don't have to say that anymore, because all these things that are up there on the screen is a huge percentage of the market. In fact, it's most of the market. But it requires understanding the whole spectrum. I have three more observations, and these have nothing to do with technical stuff, uh, but they're relevant. The best students don't choose computing anymore. They either go into biology or finance. Why are we losing them? And don't tell me about offshoring the work that has to be done. High school girls don't opt for engineering. If I was a high school girl and was put into a Java course, I probably wouldn't opt for engineering either. But the girls that we want to come to college and study engineering want to be able to sink their teeth into the right kind of problems when they're in high school, which they don't get with computing. Is there a reason we have not explored? And I've given you a hint at that reason. It's what they're getting in high school. Freshmen arrive knowing, these are observations, freshmen arrive knowing nothing about computing even though they've got an AP5 credit they, that they've earned in high school. I teach the freshman course, they have 400 freshmen, and a hell of a lot of them come in, it's a required course for double e major, for ECE majors, and a hell of a lot of them come in with AP, fee, AP grade of five, and they know nothing. So these are the observations. What do we do about it? We break the layers. We've already done it in some cases, pragmas in the language. Uh, the whole business of predication is an example of breaking the layers at the compiler and the microarchitecture together. Uh, the language, the algorithm, the language, the compiler and the microarchitecture are all working together. If we break the layers, here's several examples 
of good things that can happen. And I'm not going to, I realize that I'm getting long-winded, so I will just flash that up there so uh, the slides are available. You can look at them at your leisure. Now, the bottom two are kind of interesting, microarchitecture and the circuits. You know, internal fault tolerance. It used to be the to fault tolerance was a niche market. Fault tolerance, I guess that's an old, uh, that's an old timer's term. A high availability, right? Never goes down. Yeah, well, alpha particles make uh, a bit get flipped that had nothing to do with the logic error. So everything's fault tolerant now. Well, can, if we understand the circuits, we can put it into the microarchitecture to do the testing. For Verification hooks. I remember giving a talk at, at uh, uh, one uh, university, and the big deal professor says, why are you coming up with all these ideas for more complicated microprocessors? We can't even verify the simpler things that we have on the table right now. So making verification a first-class citizen in the uh, design of the microarchitecture. And there are several others that you uh, see there. How do we do it? We start in the freshman year. Now we do it at Texas, and I'm not going to turn this into a uh, sales pitch uh, for our freshman course. I've got several slides that show some of the things. I'm just going to flip through them very quickly. But by starting with the freshman course, and starting with this, as many of you know, my view of a bottom-up approach where they're not memorizing, but they are building on what they already know. When they get through that course, they have an appreciation of the whole spectrum. So they can talk, they can talk to each other, whether or not they're basically an algorithms person or basically a, uh, a circuit designer, for example. And we start what they know. Where I start, I'll start with quantum mechanics, by the way. Uh, for two reasons. One, I don't have to because a uh, la layer of a light switch, and that's what these transistors look like. They look like light switches, right? You bias the gate one way, it's a short. You bias the other way, it's an open. You flip the light switch one way, the light goes on. You flip it the other way, the light switch goes off. They've been doing light switches since they were two years old. So that's where I start, and I just keep building. I don't do quantum mechanics. Two reasons, I said. One, I don't need to. The other is I don't understand it, you know? <laughs> don't teach what you don't understand. Uh, choose a uh, computer model that is simple, uh, but still rich. Continually build on what they know. Continually raising the level of abstraction. Memorizing as little as absolutely necessary. Trying very hard to not introduce magic. That's my main mantra. There should be no magic. And when the kid comes out of the course, his, he or she has a foundation that they can build on, and they're ready to deal with spanning this uh, spectrum. Uh, I'm just going to flip these slides, not talk about them. There's a picture of memory. The kid in the fourth week of the freshman year understands memory. Uh, this has a, it's a three-bit addressability, and there's four words of memory here, and all the logic that goes into it. By the fourth week of the semester, they know it. Here's the instruction set. You can grok it in your head. It it's, uh, uh, takes up the inside cover of uh, the textbook. Here's a data path, very simple data path to do that instruction set architecture. Here's a state machine. All the states required to carry out the work. And so they start and they build from logic to the computer to programming, and they implement all the microarchitecture, they, uh, they see the implementation of all the microarchitecture for that machine. What I've learned about students is that the freshmen can handle it. They don't need glitz. Computer architecture, looking to the future, can begin with freshmen. Students debug their own programs because they understand what's going on. And by the way, uh, memorizing 95% correctly I get you nowhere. You know, Phil, where's Phil? So the last time, you, I think it was VG, one of your people that invited me to come and give a talk. And for my own purposes, I wanted to stay close to Yorktown, uh, to a hotel. And I wanted to spend the weekend uh, in uh, New Jersey. So I flew into Newark. Now, how do you get from Newark Airport to your place, to, to the, uh, you know, Yorktown? So you don't want to be driving in that kind of traffic, looking at the map. As you, this is before the G, GPS stuff became crazy. 
So I said, I know what I'll do. I'll memorize the directions from the Newark Airport to the hotel in White Plains. And there were 18 directions. And, you know, I flew in, as I always do, late, late at night. So I landed at, like, you know, midnight and picked up a car and started on my way. And I got 11, first 11 directions right. <laughs> the 12th direction I screwed up and spent the next two and a half hours driving around White Plains looking for this hotel. Finally, I stopped at the police station because it was the only thing that was open at that hour of the night. Uh, okay, and good students don't want to memorize. Uh, what I know about education, engineering education, there's no substitute for the kids design it for wrong, the, right? By the way, programming is design. Programming is not coding. Programming is design. You start with a sheet of paper, you write a program. And there are many correct programs for the same uh, problem. Design it wrong, debug it yourself, fix it, and see the working result. Wow. Avoid the latest fads. It's about teaching fundamentals. It's not about following the ads in the paper. Today, the pressure is for freshmen to embrace Java. By the time they graduate, C Sharp will have replaced Java. And at that point, we'll be teaching them C Sharp. But by the time they graduate, C Sharp will probably be replaced by D flat. So. <laughs> Abstractions are fantastic after you understand what's being abstracted. Most importantly, this freshman course could be taught in high school. There is nothing in that course that can't be done in high school. Nothing in it is beyond the ability of good students. The best and the brightest of the boys and girls would sign up. They want something they can sink their teeth into. We would attract the boys and girls who will make good engineers. To get there, we got to do two things. One, develop trained teachers. And secondly, get NSF and the Educational Testing Service kick their butts to get rid of, get beyond this uh, job and nonsense. So that's a charge I put out to all of you to, I don't know, write your congressman or whatever. The hope for result is uh, what I want is the future of computer architecture contri can contribute to curing cancer, predicting tsunamis. What we need is the best and the brightest to be studying our stuff, the best and the brightest coming out of the K-12 school before college, and an education, again, that spectrum, that gets them ready to meet these challenges. So with that, we have a panel coming up.